today we're going to see um, a new kind of classifier, this uh, knife base classifier. And I'm going to start by giving just a, a brief review of some uh, elementary uh, prob probabilities concepts and base rules. And then uh, we'll move on to the base classifier and to explain why we need this naive base classifier and why we call it uh, naive. Uh, and then uh, after this part, we will already have uh, this uh, uh, naive base classifier, the k nearest neighbors from last week, and logistic regression. So we are starting to uh, have uh, a nice uh, range of, of classifiers. So I'm going to cover uh, how to compare different classifiers. So how we can determine if one classifier is performing uh, better than another. And also I'm going to talk a bit about processing uh, the, the inputs and so on. So let's start with the uh, base rules. Uh, I'm going to start with this uh, um, concept from probability, which is marginal probability. So imagine that we have two random variables, x can be 1, 2, 3, or 4, and y can be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And these are the joint probability of uh, uh, the different combinations. So the probability of y being 2 and x 1 at the same time is this 0.06. Uh, the notion of marginal probability is the probability of one variable taking one value regardless of the value of the other. So the marginal probability of x, say x having one specific value, we can compute that by summing the joint probability of x with y for all the different values of y. So for example, uh, if we want to know the, the probability of x being 1, this is the sum of x being 1 and y being 2, so the probability of the two together, plus x1 and y3, and so forth. So we can sum all this column, and this would be the marginal probability of x being 1. We call it marginal because if you imagine this table, these probabilities are in the margin. So you sum uh, the columns to get the, probability, the marginal probabilities of x, the rows to get the marginal probabilities of y. So we're going to see how we can use these marginal probabilities in the naive base classifier. But before we get that, we, we need another concept here, which is this uh, product rule, which relates the joint probability with a conditional probability. <coughs> so basically, uh, the conditional probability of y having some value, if we know the value of x, can, can be given by this. So uh, we can get this a as a fraction of uh, the joint probability of y and x having those values within all the possible uh, cases where x is fixed, is fixed at that value. So if we go back to this table, for example, this column gives us the joint probabilities of y uh, uh, for the different values of y for x being 1. So y, x1, y2, x1, y3, and so on. If we want to know the probability of x being 3, if we already know, uh, oh, sorry, of y being 3, if we already know that x is 1, then it will be this value as a fraction of all of the sum of the probabilities where x is 1. Because we already know that x is 1, so we are fixed uh, in this column. And this we can compute here by the product rule. So basically, uh, uh, if we uh, do this computation, we have the, the conditional probability of y having some value if we know the value of x is the joint probability of those two values divided by the marginal probability of x having that value. And we can rearrange this and we can write the joint probability of the two values as a function of the product of the conditional probability multiplied by the marginal probability. So we can go from one to the other. So to sum up, the, the sum rule, this marginal probability, gives us the probability of one of the variables taking some value, regardless of what values the other one has. And the product rule relates the joint probability of the two variables having those specific values to the conditional probability of having one value knowing the other, and then multiplied by the marginal probability of the other. So now, this brings us to uh, Bayes rules, because we can do this uh, with for one variable with respect to the other or the other way around. It would be the same. So we can write, uh, given that the joint probability of y and x is the same 
as x, y, it doesn't matter what, what is the order of the variables we consider. If we rewrite everything, we get the joint probability of uh, x and y uh, written as the conditional probability of y given x, and we can do the same thing writing as the conditional probability of x given y. So we use the product rule on both sides, and when we uh, move this part over there, we get Bayes' rule. So the conditional probability of y having some value, if we know the value of x, can be related to the conditional probability of x if we know the value of y, and then by this fraction of the marginal probability. So now, what's the point of uh, Bayes' rule? If we have a frequency interpretation of probabilities, this means if we consider that the probability is the frequency of some uh, random variable taking some value, when we reach an infinite number of trials, then Bayes' rule is simply a rearrangement of this relation. So it can be one way or the other, it's symmetrical, you can put the terms on one side or the other. But with the Bayesian interpretation of probabilities, we are using probability as a rational measure of our confidence or certainty about something, about some value, about some hypothesis. And in that interpretation, we can think of Bayes' rule as a, 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 a base rule, as a sort of a rule for updating our confidence in a hypothesis. So the idea is that the probability that we assign to a, to a hypothesis being true after some evidence is equal to the prior probability of that hypothesis being true, regardless of the evidence, multiplied by the probability of the evidence if the hypothesis is true, and divided by the prior probability of the evidence. So basically, if we have something that most certainly must be true if the hypothesis is true, then this is high. And if this thing is surprising, if this pro prior probability is low, then it will increase, if that happens, it will increase our confidence in the, the probability of the hypothesis. One real life example of this was when, when Einstein proposed the, the, uh, his first proposal for the theory of, uh, theory of relativity it predicted that uh, a massive object would bend light. So for, according to Newton, that would not happen because light does not have mass, so it would not be bent by a, a massive object, but according to Einstein, it would. So what they did to try to test this is to use uh, a, a total eclipse of the sun and measure the position of the stars you could see behind the sun. This you can only see the stars behind the sun if there is an eclipse, because otherwise the sun is too bright. So one astronomer went to some remote island in the Pacific to observe an eclipse that was going to occur there, and he, he noticed that it was indeed like Einstein predicted. So the stars appeared to be on the wrong position because the light was being bent by the sun. So this would be the example of some evidence that was very surprised. It was implied by the hypothesis, and so it led to imp increasing the probability assigned to the hypothesis. So basically, this is the, the idea of the Bayesian interpretation and Bayes rules, where you can uh, assign some probability to a hypothesis if the, uh, uh, if the evidence supports it. So how can we do this, use this to, for classification? We can consider this probability of uh, uh, some example belonging to some class, so probability of this example X belonging to class C, and we can uh, get that, uh, estimate that probability from, uh, or this equate that probability to the prior probability of any example at random belonging to class C. This can be different from class to class if some classes have more, have more uh, instances than others. Uh, multiplied by the conditional probability of having those features if it belongs to that class, and divided by the prior probability of having those features. Uh, this, regardless of the interpretation, leads us to uh, classify an example according to these probabilities that we assign. So basically, we are going to choose the class that maximizes uh, the probability. So basically this, we can classify uh, one example by choosing the class that has the maximum value for that probability. Uh, how can we do this? We can consider this uh, conditional probability of be belonging to a class given the features as equal uh, to that product there. And we can simplify this because the, the prior probability of some example having a set of features is not relevant for classification. What we care in classification are the conditional probabilities of the class and the features and the prior probabilities of the class. So this will not 
uh, be relevant here. When we're trying to maximize this, we can ignore that and we can consider that the conditional probability of belonging to some class is proportional to the product of the prior probability of the class and the conditional probability of the features given the class. Uh, and since we can use the, uh, the product rule to uh, uh, do away with that conditional probability, we can uh, simplify this and basically what we get for the base classifier is this. We're going to assign a class to an example that maximizes the joint probability of that uh, class for that example. So if we consider all the different classes and all the different possible examples, all these combinations have some probability. And if we, if we classify the example on that class that maximizes the joint probability, then we are minimizing the risk of committing an error. So in this sense, this is an ideal classifier. If we know the joint probability distributions of classes and features, then we classify each, each example in the class that has the maximum joint probability with the features of that example. Why don't we use the base classifier? Because in theory it would be ideal. The problem is how we determine this joint probability. So let's see a, a specific example. Suppose we have a questionnaire for uh, people to fill in where they write about their uh, uh, nutrition habits, the exercise they do, and so forth, and we want to predict if they are at risk for diabetes. Let's suppose to simplify that they, we only have 20 questions and they are all yes or no. So with 20 questions we have 1 million combinations, 1 million possible combinations of yes or no. If we want to measure the joint probability of each combination of answers to each class, to either diabetic or healthy, then we will need many millions of examples because we are drawing at random, some of them will come repeated and so on, but to get a, a good estimate of the probability of each class for each combination of answers, we would need many millions of examples. So in practice we cannot use a Bayes classifier because it would require huge data sets so that we can m uh, measure these joint probability distributions. However, the idea here seems uh, good. We want to find the class that maximizes the probability of that class occurring for something with those features. This makes sense. We would like to be able to do that. So we can go to a naive base uh, classifier. To, do, to solve this problem of having to account for all possible combinations, it would simplify this if the features were independent. Because if the features are independent, then the joint probability is simply the product and we don't need to take uh, all the combinations into account. However, this is generally not the case. The features can have some dependency. And what we assume in a naive base classifier is that the features become independent once we know the class. So features are conditionally independent given the class. An example of what this would be, something uh, like this would be, uh, for example, two people live together and the time they arrive home is not independent because if there is some problem with uh, a traffic or transportation or strike or something like that, it can affect both of them. So knowing the time one of them arrived can give us some information about the time the other arrived and they are not independent variables. However, if we know all those things that affect both of them, for example, we know there was some traffic jam and so on, then if we know the time one of them arrived, we have no additional information about the other that we all wouldn't know already because we knew what happened. So this is the idea of conditional independence. The variables are not independent, but if we know some additional things, for example the class, then we can consider that they are independent. And this is what we assume to simplify the, the base classifier and it leads us, leads us to the naive base classifier. So let's say we want to estimate the joint probability of the class having some value and all the features for that particular example. So this x1, x2 and, and so on are all these uh, x vector here and for example all the 20 questions, the 20 answers in this questionnaire. We can write this as the product of all these conditional probabilities, so the prior probability of the class multiplied by the probability of the first feature given the class, multiplied by the probability of the second feature given the class and the first feature, and so on. 
But since we are, th this would be a very huge uh, train of, of computation and with a big problem of having to compute all these joint probabilities. For example, the joint probability of the class, feature one, feature two, and so forth, which would lead us to all those combinations, and it's impossible in practice to estimate. However, if we assume that each feature becomes independent given the class, then the conditional probability of the feature value given the class and all the others is the same as the conditional probability given the class because this one is independent from all the others. So it doesn't matter what the others are, we can ignore those and use only the class. So this assumption of conditional independence of the features given the class allows us to simplify everything and all these uh, factors where we have the conditional probability of one feature given the class and the other feature can be simplified to just the conditional probability of the feature given the class. So, the nice base classifier simplifies the joint probability distribution of the class and all the features to simply the prior probability of belonging to that class. This is basically due to the fact that some classes may have more examples uh, than others, so more uh, probable uh, uh, a priori, multiplied by the product of the probability of each uh, feature value given that class. And this is much simpler to compute. Usually we will not do these products because if you multiply very small values then uh, you get the floating point uh, under flow very soon. What we do is we take the logarithm of everything and we just sum the logarithm. Note that for classification we want the class with the highest probability. It doesn't matter what the exact value is, so we can use the logarithms and maximize the sum of the logarithms. So this is the naive base classifier. To classify one example using the naive base classifier, we will put it in the class that maximizes the logarithm of the prior probability of that class. So this is basically the fraction of examples that fall into that class in, in our training set, plus the sum of the logarithm of the probability of having that feature for each of the features if the example belongs to that class. And we do this for the different classes. We take the one with the highest value, and that is the classification. <coughs> to train the naive base classifier, what we need to do is, for each class, we find the prior probability. The prior probability there, uh, we can estimate by uh, counting how many examples fall in each class, and then the prior prob probability is the proportion of examples that are in each class. Also, this distribution of features we can uh, find by splitting our examples into the, the several classes and for each class see how the values of each feature are distributed. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so we are going to see some examples in practice of how to do this, but this now becomes computationally uh, a lot more acceptable. For example, for our diabetes example, we have 20 questions per questionnaire. We have people who are diabetic and people who are healthy, so we divide our data set into the two classes, healthy and diabetic. And now, for each of those classes, we are going to look at each question and see what is the fraction of yes or no. So suppose for exercise, the, quest the fraction of yes for healthy people was 70%, and the fraction of yes for uh, diabetic people was 20%, and now we have a difference there. So these would be the logarithm of the probability of each value for the feature given the class. You see that now we can do this with just a few tens of, of questionnaires because for each question all we need is to have some on the diabetic and some on the health uh, class and count the frequencies for yes or no for each question. So uh, even though we are making here a very a strong assumption which is that if we know the class then all the features become independent this is generally not true, but this assumption now allows us to compute the probabilities and to use uh, this as a classifier. To predict, we go for all those uh, logarithms of the probabilities, we sum everything for each class, and we assign an example to the class that has the highest value. So let's see uh, an abstract example with continuous values here. Suppose we have these two classes, so the blue points and the red points, as usual and we want to create a classifier for these points using knife base, so a knife base classifier for this. 
We can do this uh, in two different ways. You can uh, create a parametric naive base classifier where we assume some probability distribution, for example, a normal probability distribution, and we compute for each feature. In this case, we have two features. We have this x2 and x1. <laughs> we compute for each feature the parameters of the normal distribution. So this would be the mean and the standard deviation. <laughs> this would give us a, a, a parametric naive base because these parameters will, would specify all the probability distributions and they would specify the model. So this is the idea of having a parametric model. A parametric model is one that is completely specified by the parameters that we are determining. For example, those uh, curves that we saw in linear regression, uh, logistic regression, those are examples of parametric models. Once you fit all the parameters, you have everything specified. Uh, K-nearest neighbors, for example, is not parametric because it depends on the data that you have there. And with naive Bayes, you can also use uh, non-parametric, uh, you can create a non-parametric model. For example, if you use kernel density estimation instead of a parametric uh, distribution, then we, you, don't, you cannot specify everything with the parameters because it depends on the data that is there. And this is what we're going to do in this uh, example. We're going to use kernel density estimation to estimate the probabilities for this data. So just to uh, rem uh, recall from last week, Suppose that we have these values distributed like this along this axis. So this would be, for example, the red values here. We have few of them over here, but then we have a lot uh, on these values, on this X2 feature. Uh, we could fit this to a Gaussian curve, for example, to a normal. We compute the mean and the standard deviation, and this is an approximation. But this is not very good. It does not capture well the, the difference in density here. We could use a histogram, for example. This, a histogram would be a non-parametric way of computing the, the distribution of probabilities there. Or we can use something smoother, which is a kernel density uh, estimation like we, did, we saw last week. So basically, each point contributes uh, a Gaussian curve. We sum everything, and we get this smoother curve. So that's what we're going to do for this classifier. We can take uh, this first feature, let's call it x1, and we split the data into two classes. Now we use kernel density estimation to draw the distribution of the density of the probabilities for the red points. You see most of them are over here, and then there are a few of them here, and then it falls down to zero. So this is the curve that describes the distribution of uh, feature X1 for the red class. And this is the same thing for the blue class. So now we have the conditional probability distributions of this feature for the two classes. Those, uh, that thing there. So the probability of the feature having some values given the class. This is given for the blue class and for the red class. Now we do the same thing for the other feature. It's exactly the same idea. Uh, more red here, so the curve is higher here. More blue here, the blue curve is higher here. Now, how do we estimate the joint probability distribution? We, we need to know the joint probability distribution of the features given the class, but since we are assuming conditional independence, this is simply the product of them. So we can multiply the red curve for one of the class, with the red curve for the other, and we have uh, an estimate of the joint probability distribution of these features for the red class. Note that we can do this because we are assuming that if we know the class, then the features are independent, and we just have to multiply them. Without that as assumption, we would have to go for every point and try to estimate the number of times uh, examples fell there, and that would require a lot more data. We do the same thing for the blue one, and now, how do we classify? Assuming that the prior probabilities are the same, so if the, the classes are balanced, the prior probability of being red or blue is the same, we can simply take the largest uh, value of these surfaces. So this would be something like this. That uh, is also dependent of the, on the width of the kernel we use for kernel density estimation. So if the kernels we are using are broad, we get uh, curves that are smoother, and we get a, a, a softer curve here in the classifier. If we have a very narrow uh, kernel, 
then the curves will have lots of peaks and values, and we can uh, valleys, and we can have a more, much more complex uh, surface here. So we have this parameter to adjust, and the way we do it, you should already know, is just do cross validation to find the best one. So we are uh, changing the parameter from zero to four, and we are training in nine of the folds. So this is ten folds cross validation, leaving ten percent of the data out and measure the error there. And then we leave a different subset of 10% out and do this 10 times and average the errors to get each point here. Now we do that for each different value of the, the kernel side. And you see here the training error and, uh, sorry, the, the uh, training, uh, yes, the training error and validation error. And we can choose the one with the smallest cross validation error, uh, which is around here 1.8. Uh, and so this would be our classifier after optimizing the width of the kernel. So by using a kernel width of 1.8, we compute the distributions of probabilities for each feature given each class. And now for the classification, we just mul uh, multiply the probability of prior probability of the class and the feature or sum the logarithms. Yeah? Uh, after this, now after this, we could uh, test the final result with a test set to get a, a non-biased estimate of the true error. But usually, cross-validation we do to optimize the parameters. You can also do cross-validation to estimate the true error of the model, but that's usually when you have uh, very few data points and you don't want to leave out a test set. So that is not ideal. But in general, cross-validation is useful to, for optimizing parameters. And once you have the final hypothesis trained on the complete training set, so this is now trained with the whole training set, we, you can now try to uh, estimate the true error of the hypothesis by measuring the error on some test set. Okay? So this would be an example of a non-parametric naive-based classifier. Non-parametric because we're using a kernel density estimation, so the, the shape of these curves does not depend solely on the parameters we use, but also on the data we use for training. And we have to retain this data for the, the kernel density estimator. Uh, and this is a non-parametric naive-based classifier. Now let's see another example. Uh, also a non-parametric knife-based classifier with uh, uh, discrete uh, features. So uh, up to now, we saw two different cases where we had continuous features, the x values, and we had the continuous y values for regression. And we also saw when we had continuous features, the x values, and discrete y values for classification. Here we're going to see an example where we're also doing classification, but we have discrete features. So our features are not continuous numbers. They are different uh, values. For example, uh, in this particular case, this is a data set on mushrooms. And the mushrooms are divided into two classes, poisonous and edible. And each mushroom is described by a set of features. For example, the cap shape, the surface of the cap, uh, the odor, the spacing between the gills, and so on. And the values each feature can take are discrete. For example, cap shape can be bell shaped, conical, convex, flat, etc. So we don't have numerical constants for uh, or numerical continuous values for the features. We have only these uh, discrete features to describe each muscle. And the data set looks like this. So the first column indicates whether the mushroom is poisonous or edible. And the other columns are in order the different features. For example, this X here means that the cap shape is convex. Uh, then we have an S there for the cap surface is smooth and so forth. So this is, uh, as you can see, it would be hard to use this data, for example, with logistic regression. We don't have numbers here. We would have to find some way of converting these values to numbers. And if there is no ordering to the values, that can lead to an explosion of features with different types of encoding. But we can use naive base classifier with this because all we need to know are the probabilities of each value for each feature depending on the class, given the class. So we can uh, use this. We can uh, count 
the occurrences of each value for each feature and compute those probabilities. So the, the assignment, I will probably give you the, the, the text for the assignment this week, by the weekend or something like that. But the assignment will also involve support vector machines, which we will only see next week on the lecture. Uh, so basically the idea is that you start uh, after next week on the assignment and you have two weeks for the assignment, but I'll give you the, the assignments a bit earlier and you can start uh, with that. For the assignment, you will implement a naive based classifier using continuous features. So the previous example, I gave you the idea, not the code, but the general idea of how to implement. I'm going to show this in a bit more detail with the code so that uh, if you have questions about the detail of the, of the implementation or the algorithm, you can look, look at, at the example for discrete features and then extrapolate from there. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is to figure out for each of the features what are the possible values. Because some features have, uh, for example, the cap shape has one, two, three, four, five, six values, the cap surface has only four, and so forth. And we need to know this before we compute the, the different frequencies. Uh, we can look at this uh, features file, which describes all the features, like this. The first feature is cap shape, and it can be bell, conical, convex, uh, and so forth. We are going to read this. We're going to look at the, the character after the equal sign, which is the code for each of the values of the feature, and we're going to put everything into a, a string. So basically, we are splitting by the equal sign, uh, and for each of the fragments, we are taking the first character after the equal sign. And we're going to put this in a string, also including a question mark. This is because in our data set, uh, we don't see any example here, but there are a few, in our data set, some of the mushrooms have question marks on some of the features because those features were not observed or not, not registered. So we need to use also the question mark as a, a new value that some can have and let our um, uh, classifier deal with that uh, as appropriate. So when we get the features, we'll get these strings. These, uh, these are the possible values for the first feature, cap shape. These are the possible values for cap surface and so forth. So we now we have a list of what the possible values are for each feature, and we can uh, load the data and convert these characters into numbers indicating the index on these uh, strings. So instead of storing, for example, a B, we store the number one because this is the value of index one on that feature. Uh, this makes it simple then to create the vectors with all the different frequencies. So basically, we open the, the data file, so this file here. We read each line. Uh, um, we um, replace the, the comma there with uh, an empty string. So basically, we delete the, co the comma and we get just a string with all the codes. And now we find the index of each character in uh, our string for each of the features. And we convert this into a numerical matrix that tells us what is the number of each value for each feature here. So for example, suppose that uh, convex is index 2, so it's the third value here. Uh, actually, if we add the, the question mark, uh, it will be uh, the fourth value, so index 3. Uh, this x will now become a 3 and it will indicate us that for that feature the value that is there is the value of index 3. And we do this for everything so we can put everything into a numerical matrix. Another thing that we do is we take out the first column. The first column uh, gives us poison or edible. This is not a feature. This is what we want to predict. So we keep that apart. And then we shuffle everything. Now here, probably last week, you already had this problem when loading the data and shuffling, because there are many different ways you can do this. But in the end, after shuffling, you have to keep the correspondence between features and labels. So if you have everything in one matrix, you can just shuffle the matrix, because it shuffles the rows and leaves the columns unchanged. If you have things in two matrices, like we did here, we have the classes and the features, then we cannot shuffle each of them independently because it would scramble all the features and the classes. So you can do is create 
uh, a list with the indexes of the rows, 0, 1, 2, and so on until the last row, shuffle that index, and then use the same index for both the, the features and the classes. Either way, you don't need to memorize the recipe, but remember that you want to change the ordering of the data. This is useful not only to help you split into training and tests or into different folds, because if the, if the data is sorted, it will give you some strange results, but also for some classifiers, we'll see uh, neural networks in the next lecture, uh, the ordering is important. If you have everything in a strange order, you can reduce the ability to converge to, to a good solution. But when you shuffle, don't lose the correspondence between the features and the target values. So now we're going to compute a, a histogram. The, the scare quotes there are because this is not quite a histogram. We don't have an X axis with a, an ordered set of values. But you, you can imagine that for each possible value of the feature, we will have a bar with the frequencies, and it would look something like a histogram. That's what we are computing here. So we want to do this because we want those probabilities. The probability of, of this feature having value i given the class. One problem is what happens if we don't have any example in our data set that for that class has that specific value in that particular feature. If this happens, we will have a zero there. When we compute the logarithms, it will give an error. Or if we try to multiply, then everything will be zero after that. So this is the, a problem because if we don't have an example with a specific case, then probabilities are zero and it ruins everything. To do that, we're going to do this additive smoothing. We will always count the number of, of occurrences plus some alpha values. So, uh, for example, if there are three occurrences of this value in this feature, uh, and we are using alpha equal to one, we will count four. If there are zero, we will always count at least one. So there is some small probability, but it will not be zero. To adjust so that the sum of all the counts for all the different values of the feature adds up to the total number, so to one, uh, when we uh, compute the frequencies, uh, because it must be, it's a probability, we also need to divide not only by the number of examples, but by uh, but summing, adding to the number of examples, that smoothing factor we use, multiplied by the number of different values we have in this feature, so that everything uh, adds up to one in the end. But basically this is just a trick to avoid having zero when we count the frequency. And this is what we're going to do this. For each of the features, we're going to create uh, a vector which is as long, uh, as the same number of elements as these strings that de describe the possible values of the feature. So we have a list of all these vectors. And now, uh, for each of uh, uh, example in our data, we're going to increment uh, the uh, for each of the features, we're going to increment the element in that vector that corresponds to the value of the feature. So, for example, if we have uh, a mushroom where the cap uh, shape is unknown, it has a, a question mark, we increment one in the first element. If it's bell-shaped, then we increment one in the second element, and so on. Since these vectors were created with the, the function one, they all start at one. So even if we don't find any example, we already have a one there, which is the additive smoothing that we're using. So these, when we divide by the, the total number of points plus this adjustment here, will give us a vector with the frequencies of the occurrence of each value for each feature in that data set. And now we can do that by uh, computing for uh, class 0, which is the edible uh, mushroom, and class 1, which is the poisonous mushroom. So note that for the nice base classifier, we are computing the frequencies for each class. We need to do this. So we need to split the data into the different classes and compute the frequencies for each class. So this would be the, the list of frequencies of the, the attribute values, of the feature values for the edible mushroom. This would be for the poisonous mushroom. And now we can uh, create a set of um, uh, test points. So here we are just splitting into edible and poisonous. We are uh, creating a test set for the edible and poisonous classes. 
So this gives us a stratified sample. We always use the same proportion of edible mushrooms and the same proportion of poisonous mushrooms for the test set. Uh, and now uh, we can, uh, this is just to split the data, and now we can compute the values for the, uh, the frequencies for the two plasmas. So this would be the, the histogram, so to speak, the, the frequency values for the edible mushrooms and the frequency values for the poisonous mushrooms. Now, when we want to classify, we can use this function that receives the frequency values for edible and poisonous, uh, plus the prior probability of being an edible mushroom or a poisonous mushroom. This is simply computed by the number of examples we have in each class. And how do we do the classification here? So for each example that we want to classify, we start with the logarithm of the prior probability of being edible and the logarithm of the prior probability of being uh, poisoned. This is the baseline probability. If we don't have any other information, we would go for the class with the, the largest number of examples. But now, for each feature, we're going to add the logarithm of the probability of that feature having that value in each of the classes. So, the probability of that feature having that value, if the mushroom is edible, we add to the edible uh, mushroom uh, logarithmic sum. And uh, the same thing for poison. So basically what we're doing here is we are computing um, this part here, all these probabilities we computed from the training set by looking at the frequencies, and we are adding them all for the class of mushrooms that are poisonous and for the class of mushrooms that are edible. So this is what we're doing for both classes uh, here. Okay? For the edible class, for the poisonous class. And now we check. We are assuming that the predicted classes are zero, so zero is edible. We create initially a matrix where everything is uh, inedible. So a vector of predictions that sets all the mushrooms to edible. And now we check if the, the sum of the logarithms of the probabilities for the edible class is smaller than for the poisonous class, then we, we change our prediction to one. So it's edible if it has a larger probability uh, in the edible class. If it's larger in the poisonous class, we change the prediction to poisonous. So this is how we do the prediction, and now we can put everything together. We read the features from the file, we get the data split into train and test. We use 50% either way, so half of the data for train, half uh, for, for testing. Now we create those histograms, the probabilities, for using only the training data, the training set. And we do that for the... the um, uh, yeah, edible class and for the poison class. So remember that we had to split the data into the two classes so we can compute the frequencies of the, the, the attribute values for the different classes. Uh, and now we can uh, compute the prior probability. So this is basically the logarithm of the number of uh, um, uh, edible mushrooms in our training, exact, uh, in our training set divided by the total number of examples in our training set. And the same for uh, the poisonous one. So the prior probability is, is just the frequency of examples in that class. <coughs> and now we classify, we classify the edible mushrooms and we classify the poisonous mushrooms in the test set. The errors are those edible mushrooms that were classified as poisonous. So poisonous is one, edible is zero. If we sum the, the numbers obtained in the vector for the predictions for the edible mushroom, these will be all the errors, because these are the edible mushrooms that should have been predicted as zero, but are predicted as one. And one minus the predictions for the poisonous mushrooms, because if we are predicting a poisonous mushroom to be a zero, that's edible, that would be uh, an error. So this is how we can count all the errors. We can compute the percentage of the errors. In this case, we have 191 errors. This is a 4.7% error in the, in the test set. And we can compute the, the confusion matrix. So this is basically 
the uh, number of examples in our test set which are edible mushrooms and classified as edible mushrooms. These are the poisonous mushrooms classified as edible mushrooms, these are the edible mushrooms classified as poisonous, and these are the poisonous mushrooms classified as poisonous. So we have the different uh, sums here. Now one, one thing, I'm not going to go into detail here, you can look at the code later, but one thing that is useful when you're trying to do these things in Python, in Python 3 you can use this F string. So if you write a string with an F immediately before the, the, the quote, the single quote or double quote, then everything that you write inside curly braces are expressions that Python will evaluate. So the actual text is outside the curly braces, but this sum 1 minus CE is actually an expression that will be evaluated. And you can then specify the formatting. For example, here I'm saying uh, with zero uh, 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 decimal places. So in this case it will be printed as an integer. Uh, you can look up these, these formattings and how to use these strings. So the only thing to remember is you can use these special strings with an F uh, before, and it makes it easier to generate this kind of, of report. So here you can look at the, the confusion matrix, and we, and we see that our classifier is pretty good. It has only less than 5% error rate. However, it's, most of the errors are in this category, where uh, we are classifying as edible mushrooms that are poisonous. This is not a very good error to make. It would be much better if it, it was making the other error that would be safer but classifying as edibles mushrooms that are poisonous is not a good idea. So this, we're going to go back to this later in the semester, but minimizing the error may not be ideal in some situations where different errors have different potential costs. Uh, <coughs> so to sum up, he, uh, an another property of um, uh, naive-based classifiers, which is different from what we've been seeing in the in the previous examples, in the uh, uh, k-nearest neighbors and logistic regression. In those cases, we are trying to find a discriminant between the classes. So, uh, w those classifiers like logistic regression, for example, we were explicitly trying to uh, compute the conditional probability of the class given the features. So, if we know the features, we can compute whether it's in class 1 or class 0. But we cannot do it the other way around. So if you tell a logistic regression classifier what is the class, there is no way it can give you the features because it cannot compute uh, on the other direction. Generative classifiers are those that compute joint probability distributions and then use the joint probability distributions to compute the probability of the class. Because they are computing joint probability distributions, they can be used in reverse to generate data. For example, we can use this data set here and uh, uh, create uh, a nice base classifier, as we saw previously. But now we have the probability distributions of the features for each of the classes. So we can tell our nice base classifier what is the class that we want and sample at random from those probability distributions. So we can use this classifier, for example, to generate this data. It's not as pretty as this one, but you can see that we have more red over here, more blue over here, more or less in the same shape. Because we are using those curves of the probability distributions to sample feature values for the synthetic data. So one, one characteristic of classifiers like the naive base classifier is that you can use them to generate synthetic data using the same distributions as the training data that you use. Now, for comparing classifiers, suppose that we have this uh, uh, test set here, the, the cross is there, we train a logistic regression by expanding our data, a k-nearest neighbors and a naive base classifier, and now we have these results. With logistic regression we have 10 errors in the test set, with k-nearest neighbor 6 and with naive base 1. So the question is, which one is better? We would be inclined at first to just look at the number of errors, but remember that this is a sample of possible errors. If we were using a different test set, we would get a different number of errors. So the question is, are these really differences between the classifiers, or it just happened to uh, have that number of errors in the particular set that we use? So to answer that question, we need to uh, do some approximate test, statistical test, to see if the difference is significant. 
One way we can use this is to assume that the classifier has some probability of uh, classifying an example as class 1 or class 2. This basically gives us those binomial distributions that we can approximate to a normal distribution using a large enough number. And uh, uh, we have this notion of uh, a confidence interval. So this is similar to those um, tests that you use in statistics, like the, the, the student test and so forth. You are checking to see if the difference is large enough so that it would not, it would not be probable that they were performing exactly the same way and still give such a large difference. So basically, uh, you can compute this, um, the expected uh, uh, standard deviation from the number of errors, given the probability of the, the um, uh, classifier making an error, uh, by, uh, by this formula. And uh, with this approximation to a normal distribution, we know that 95% uh, of the time uh, uh, things will fall in 1.96 of this standard distribution, uh, of the standard deviation. So the standard deviation you can compute from uh, the number of errors that you have here, or the fraction of errors uh, that you are making in your test set, assuming that it's uh, approximately a binomial distribution. And uh, this gives you an estimate of what would be the confidence interval uh, for that classifier. So if you have a, a classifier that made 10 errors in those 45 uh, examples in the test set, this would be something that was 10 plus or minus 5 uh, would be the expected range uh, for, for the, the real error rate of that classifier. And you can do the same thing for the other ones, k nearest neighbor, for naive base. And now we can see that, for example, with k nearest neighbors, this 6 and that 10, they are the, the confidence intervals intersect. So it's possible uh, with more than 5% probability that these are actually performing the same, only it happens in that data set that the results are different. For naive base compared to logistic regression, this is no longer the case. It would be very uh, less than 5% probability, uh, our estimate here, that these would have the same uh, uh, performance because they are too far apart and these intervals are, are not in touch. Uh, a better alternative, this McNamara test, uh, uses this approximately uh, t-squared distribution, counting the number of errors that one classifier is making that the other is not making and vice versa. So these are the errors made by classifier uh, B and not by classifier A, and these are the errors made by classifier A and not by classifier B. So when we subtract the two, we have this uh, adjustment there, the uh, minus one. Uh, uh, we uh, compute the absolute value of this difference and divide it by the sum of these errors. This is approximately distributed like uh, the, the key square distribution. So we can also go look up the table with those degrees of freedom where the 95% confidence interval is. And basically, if this ratio is above 3.84, it's less than 5% probable that this happens if the, uh, uh, the two classifiers perform the same. Uh, so in that case, we reject the null hypothesis and we consider that they must be different. So for Comparing logistic regression with k nearest neighbors, we don't see a significant difference. k nearest neighbors with naive bays, it's not a significant difference, but naive bays with logistic regression, this is significant. So basically, of these three, we can say that logistic regression is performing worse than naive bays. The other comparisons, we are not so sure. Another uh, detail here. We already saw different examples of continuous features of uh, um, prediction for regression and classification and so on and different classifiers. And we've been always um, doing things more or less in the same way. We get the data, we standardize or normalize everything. We talked a bit about stratified sampling, but we are not going to explore that very much. So the, the problem here is that depending on the situation, uh, you need to do different things uh, to the data before feeding into the classifier. So what I'm going to talk about is just briefly give you some examples of what you need to think 
uh, in this situation. Uh, and uh, there are two questions here. How we stratify the data and how we rescale the data. So when we do standardization or normalization. Uh, for standardization or normalization, what we do is we compute some values, for example, the mean value, the standard deviation, and then we rescale all the data in that way. But in theory, we should be computing those parameters only for the training set and then applying the same parameters outside the training set because they are parameters we are computing from the data and we are not sure if they apply equally well outside the data. The thing is that in practice uh, these statistics tend to converge very uh, rapidly. So for example, suppose that we have 2000 points and they are distributed like this. The values are distributed like this. We split them at random, 1,000 uh, to each side. And if you check the difference between the mean values of one, uh, a random set of 1,000 of these points and the mean of a random set, the other 1,000, is less than 1.4% of the standard deviation. So we think that in theory these are parameters that we should compute for the training set and then apply to the test set and not compute with everything. But they are so similar when you have a reasonable data set that you're just wasting time computing everything uh, repeatedly. Okay? So this is the idea. The reason why we usually do rescaling on the complete data set is because it makes no difference if we do it on the complete data set or just the training set. And we don't need to go through the extra bother of, for example, with the cross-validation, computing, rescaling everything each time we change the fold on cross-validation and so forth. But in theory, we should uh, worry about that because these are parameters that we are adjusting to the data and we need to adjust to, uh, we cannot be adjusting parameters to the data we're going to use for testing. Okay. But let's see that in some cases, uh, this may be a bit tricky. For example, suppose that these values are the money people spend on transportation. And this has this distribution. Most people spend about uh, 40 euros a month, some spend more, some spend less, and so forth. But imagine that this is actually taken from different cities, and in different cities the distribution is different. It's just that we have the aggregate of the different cities, but different cities have different uh, uh, living expenses, and the cost of transportation is different, and so on. So, how do we do this? How can we split the data and compute the scaling parameters? Suppose that we want to consider all these examples, so people from all the different cities, and we are going to try to predict something using this feature for people from those cities without caring about the city they come from. In that case, it would be a good idea if we split our data, for example, for cross-validation, using stratified sampling so that each set gets the same proportion from different cities. Because we assume that when we are going to apply our, our classifier, we're going to get more or less the same proportion of people from the different cities. But suppose we have, in this case, it would not make much difference if we rescale everything once or if we rescale the training set, because if we have a large set of data, uh, the, the mean value and the standard deviation will be approximately the same. But now suppose that we have a different problem. We have these cities, and we want to use the data from these cities to predict something about a different city. Now we need to consider the problem that between different cities things vary quite a lot and the distributions are different. So it would not make sense to split our data in this way. It would make more sense to split our data according to cities. Because now we want to see what happens when we use data from one city to predict what happens in the other. And if we do this, then the, our rescaling values should also be computed for the training set and not for the complete set because now the distributions are different and if we uh, use the, the same value for everything or if we use all the data to compute these parameters we are cheating a bit on the result. So the, the message here is uh, we are not going to focus much on this because uh, this machine learning course is for the, the basic, the basic concepts, the algorithms and so on. But what I wanted to uh, call your attention to is avoid memorizing the recipes. So just because we do something in some particular way in the tutorial or something like that, doesn't mean that this is sacred and it has to be done always the same way. So do not memorize the recipes. Always try to understand what we're doing. Because depending on the problem, 
things may have to be done in different ways because of always the fundamental problem which is to try to use data from one set to predict something outside of that set. Depending on the characteristics of the set, you need to think about how to work with the data. So, to sum up for this first part, we saw the uh, base classifier, naive base classifier. Important part here is that assuming conditional independence of the features given the class simplifies the estimate of the probability distributions and allows us to use the classifier. If we don't do that, then we would need too much data to, to be able to use it. We also saw this difference between parametric and non-parametric models. Basically, non-parametric models uh, are not completely determined by the parameters we compute and we need something else, for example, the data uh, in order to use the model. Uh, also, naive base is a generative classifier because we have the probability distributions of the features. We can generate new examples sampling from those distributions. So to, you have uh, about this uh, naive base, you have these sections on uh, these books. And if you have questions, 